There is an end game. It has been working towards it uh, for a long time. This has not been going on for five years or 50 years, but this, this goes back thousands of years. And uh, the, the key to increasing human control has been increasing human centralization of power. So, for instance, um, there was a time when you, the human race um, was uh, made up of tribes. And the tribes um, decided what happened in the tribe. Then there came a big change when lots of tribes came together under what were called nations. And then a few people at the center of the nation were now dictating to all the former tribes that made up that nation. Through the European Union, we've gone to the next level, which is to bring the nations together under centralized control. And the idea eventually is to have a world government, world army, world central bank, world currency, cashless, um, which we're heading to so fast. Um, and, uh, and underpinning the, uh, that structure of centralized global control uh, is complete control of human perception. And it's happening in front of our eyes. It's not just surveillance. All the things that the human race posts on the internet, posts on social media, all that is being fed into um, AI, which is becoming enormously skilled at understanding the human psyche, mm. therefore able to manipulate the human psyche to control what? We're back to it, control perception. But the end game in terms of con complete control of human perception is to connect the human brain to artificial intelligence. And um, this is something I've been warning about now for so freaking long. And the Silicon Valley crazies are now openly talking about it. Once that connection's made, he said AI will do more and more and more of human thinking until human thinking as we currently know it will be basically negligible. In other words, the human mind will become AI, and instead of manipulating human perception, human perception will become direct through um, AI. And this is how they've done it. And what you do is you start Excellent. at A, and you know you're going to Z. But if you go in too big a leap to Z, the change is such that people go, what's going on, what's going on, what's happening? So you go as big a leap as you can, but not so big that people see the pattern. So the totalitarian tiptoe to um, controlled by AI, went like this. Stage one, get them addicted to technology that they hold. Your goal is to get in the body. So first of all, stage one, you get them addicted to technology they hold. So we had this explosion of uh, the smartphone era. Vast, vast ever. numbers of people are absolutely addicted to technology they hold. You go to stage two, they're holdables. Next stage, wearables. You're going in the body, so next stage you get on the body. This is your Apple Watch, your Bluetooth, and all these things. Ooh, and what they're drawing. doing is conditioning normality. But Elon Musk, Musk comes, comes out Africa. and says that AI could be the end of the human race. On that, he's right. And then he opens a freaking company called Neuralink to connect the human brain to computers. Yeah. I mean, talk me through that. The only uh, way... Uh, that they are going to connect everyone to AI, no matter where they are in the world, is by having the, every inch of the planet covered with Wi-Fi. The human brain is going to be connected to the cloud. So the cloud has to be global. And they are putting thousands and thousands of satellites up in orbit. Uh, Musk, one of the major ones through his company SpaceX, to beam Wi-Fi at the planet so no one can escape from it. Do you know, notice how everything today is called smart? Mm -hmm. everything, everything called smart is part of a smart grid, and part of that smart grid is connecting AI to the human brain. So everything is, connected by a, uh, is controlled by AI, and whoever controls AI controls everything. And, and from one central point, when this grid is up and running and it's, it's being put into place more and more every day all over the world, whoever controls that central point controls not only uh, uh, you know, everything uh, technologically, controls the human mind. And it, see how fast things move. Um, I remember some books ago, not that long ago really, 
I was warning about the plan for something called the Internet of Things, where everything is connected to the Internet. Now, already billions of things are connected to the Internet. Everything's connected to AI and the Internet. And so the idea um, uh, is uh, if you before you can make a physical connection to AI and people accept this, you've got to make a psychological connection. And what they're doing, uh, and because it, it's all a psychological game, the few cannot control billions unless they control the psyche of the billions. It's a, it's a very, very important um, psychological manipulation technique. It's called preemptive programming. Mm. Okay, this is how it works. You are here, you want to go there. That society is so dramatically different to this one, you're going to you're going to face a response against it. You want to do what? So what you do is you fill the movies and the programs with storylines and scenes and portrayals of that world. And so what you're doing, and, and, and you look at the movies that have come out in the last like 10, 15, 20 years about this whole world of... Um, uh, technology and robots and AI and, and, and what you're doing is you're, pre you're, you're um, preparing the subconscious particularly the subconscious conscious as well to become familiar with the world you want to take people into over so, window. so as the world is brought in for real that familiarity is going to lessen the resistance to it because there's a familiarity so about it gonna... you've got to get people familiar with AI and interacting with it yeah. as if it's human Pop. and that's what the office assistants are for mm. so you see the thing is that when people become addicted to something like technology mm. they think they need it yeah. but they don't necessarily need it I mean I, 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 I don't carry a smartphone but what it's doing Mentally. it's it's creating especially with the kids and these AI connected Barbie dolls and stuff it's making them familiar with AI to the point where they perceive it as human and once they've got that uh, acceptance and that interaction then when they move into connected to here you, again you're going to have far less resistance because the, it's not the oh my god kind of reaction yeah, there's no shock there. it's, it's no shock it it, it's normal. become part of life by yeah. then and that's why they're targeting the kids now because they are going to be the adults 20 30 when they really want this to come in full-blown We are producing a lot more data than we're capable of storing today. We think that to put a dent on the problem, uh, we need a radical new solution. And so we're looking at DNA as one such solution. And one of the reasons that we're, we're using DNA is its density is, is orders of magnitude higher than anything that exists today. Its reliability and resiliency, and then it is, has relevancy. We think that as long as there are humans alive, we'll care about reading our own DNA. And that means that we'll have a storage format that will be with us that will always be relevant. We have been working on using DNA for data storage for several years now, and, but the process so far has been incredibly manual. There are literally people moving around with pipettes in their hands. So the only way we're going to make DNA data storage scale up to be usable and be, you know, go mainstream is by automating it. And what we've done with this, with the project that you're going to learn more about now, is showing that it's possible to automate the entire process from bits to molecules and back to, to bits. The writing process takes your data file uh, and encodes those ones and zeros into 
A, C's, T's, and G's. Uh, those A, C's, T's, and G's are actually what gets sent to the device itself. Every base that flows into the column incorporates itself onto a strand of DNA. So once all the DNA bases have been incorporated into the strands on the column, the strands need to be removed from the column. So we pump a chemical mixture into the column, which frees them from their solid support and pushes them into a liquid storage bottle. So once we decide to read the data off the DNA, the read master mix is applied to the DNA storage pool. That master mix prepares the DNA to be read. Now that the DNA is readable, it gets pumped into the read device where it gets translated into A, C's, T's, and G's sequences the computer can understand. Those sequences then get decoded back into ones and zeros. Uh, moving into the future, what we'd like to do is move fluids around in a more intelligent way, uh, which is accomplished by the Purple Drop project. Uh, so we're basically making the uh, like biological primitives, moving and mixing droplets, accessible like software is today, because you can just compose it as much as you want. So you can start with simple systems, and then you can build it up into like an automatic experimentation machine. Uh, basically what you're doing is, because water is polarizable, you can generate a charge in it. And so by changing the charge on the board in different locations, you can attract the water to those locations. And I think the other thing that's interesting to realize about this result too is that this might be pointing to a new kind of computer system that has an electronic component and a molecular component. So you use molecules for what they're good at, use electronics for what they're good at, and then you integrate them and show that it's actually possible to build a system that has dry electronics, wet molecules, and they together do something amazing. Microsoft has seen this impending crisis of not being able to store information as we move forward. And invest in a technology that could revolutionize the way that we think about data storage. Humans use technology to store an incredible amount of data, and we may reach a limit soon if we don't find new technologies. Fortunately, DNA might just hold the answer to our data needs. Google processes 3.5 billion searches every day. Every minute, 4.3 million videos are watched on YouTube and more than 156 million emails are sent. On average, 8,000 tweets are tweeted every second and more than 350 million photos are uploaded to Facebook every single day. By 2020, every person will generate an estimated 1.7 megabytes of data in just one second. This adds up to equal 410 trillion gigabytes of data in a single year, assuming the world's population will be at about 7.8 billion. It's predicted that by 2025, this figure will rise to 107 trillion gigabytes. If we don't find better data storage technologies, we could be moving towards a massive bottleneck in our storage capabilities, which could stunt growth for businesses and innovations. An alternative to our current storage devices is DNA-based data storage. DNA has a lot of advantages when it comes to data storage. For example, it's ultra compact and easy to replicate. A single gram of DNA can store up to 215 petabytes, which is 215 million gigabytes. The entire world's data could be stored in just one kilogram of the stuff. And you can store everything from text to images and videos in DNA. It can last hundreds of thousands of years and won't degrade over time like cassette tapes and CDs. In a recent breakthrough, Microsoft and researchers at the University of Washington developed the world's first DNA storage device that carries out the entire process automatically. Using the device, researchers encoded the word hello into DNA and converted it back to readable data. The device first converts the digital files into binary code consisting of ones and zeros, or bits. The system then uses a specialized software that encodes the bits into DNA sequences using strands of the DNA's four-letter alphabet, A, T, C, and G. The device then synthesizes the DNA and stores it as a liquid. Next, the stored DNA is read by a DNA sequencer. Finally, the decoding software translates the sequences back into bits that can be understood by computers. This DNA storage device may be amazing, but the concept is not brand new. 
Scientists have been storing digital data in DNA since 2012. They encoded a 52,000 word book and thousands of small pieces of DNA. But the method they used was inefficient and the storage capacity was very limited. Per gram of DNA, they could only store about 1.3 petabytes of data. Even though techniques are improving, before DNA data storage can be used commercially, the time and cost of synthesizing DNA and decoding the information needs to come down. It took a whopping 21 hours to write the 5-byte hello message and read it back out. The device alone costs roughly $10,000. Adding this to the cost of precursor materials to synthesize DNA makes the process uneconomical. But DNA technology and synthetic biology are moving at an unprecedented rate. It costs $2.7 billion in 15 years to sequence the first human genome. Today, all it takes is two days and $1,000 to sequence your entire genome. Everything alive demonstrates that DNA is already the world's most flexible and useful storage medium. We just need to learn how to harness what nature has been doing for billions of years and utilize it in our technologies. Mesma is a system created by Engineered Arts, bringing lifelike humanoid robots into the world of entertainment and research. Our robots are used by our customers for a range of applications across the globe. Be it for education into robotics, to draw a crowd at a trade show or attraction, to give specific information, or merely to amaze and entertain. They offer an exciting way to engage with the public. Mesmer is there to be tailored to your individual requirements, not only in the way it looks, but also in the way it performs with the content it delivers. It can... <sighs> Sorry, am I keeping you awake? Well, I do have a meeting with my agent in half an hour. I'm opening a gallery at 12 and giving a TED talk at 3. So, if you could just focus on me now and not on those other robots. OK, let's look a little closer at you. As you can see, the eyes have full movement. The eyelids have a fast, realistic, natural looking blink. Now we can actuate further movement in the mouth and brows. The skin is made from a super soft but durable silicon, making it very stretchy and easy to create realistic movements. The skin is painted and individual human hairs inserted. It is now that Mesmer really begins to look more human. Ouch, was that necessary? We've also created a simple way to remove the seamless skin, if required to do so. Let's have a look beneath the skin. Firstly, we've designed a five-axis articulated neck, which gives ultra-smooth and realistic movement in a full range. Camera-mounted eyes, which are made and realistically hand-painted, as well as 3D-printed teeth and tongue. Let's get you back together. Oh. Oh. HD cameras in each eyeball are used for tracking movement, for face and expression detection, and for aiding advanced human interaction. And don't forget to mention the two-axis movement in my jaw. Yes, the two-axis jaw, combined with lip movement, can be pre-choreographed to run simultaneously with a script or lip sync to audio. Very handy when using Tin Man, which Owen will tell you all about in a moment. Mesmer heads are easy to detach for transit or swapping over. Just pull the catch and lift. Simple. Oh, well, I'm not sure I like this. Wow, wow, that was weird. Mesmer is very simple to use once installed at your venue. We can preload any content to your requirements or you can create your own unique content using our easy-to-use software, Virtual Robot. Another unique and really popular feature is telepresence, which Owen will tell you all about now. 
Oh, thank you, Morgan. Yes, one of my most popular and engaging features is my telepresence. By using our Tin Man app, I can be remotely controlled by an operator from anywhere in the world to interact with you. Basically, a real human can be sitting at a laptop, PC or tablet remotely who is looking through my eyes, listening through my ears and speaking through my animated mouth. It really works well and is a big hit with audiences anywhere I go. Well, that's enough about me. I have appointments to attend. But as you can see, the applications and possibilities for me are endless. I hope to meet you soon. And if you see me, do stop for a chat. So I'm standing next to two Amicus. Uh, they're our latest generation uh, of, of humanoid robot designed for human robot interaction. So the reason for making a robot that looks like a person is to interact with people. So face, human face is a very high bandwidth communication tool. And that's why we built these expressive robots. A lot of people working on AI, uh, interaction, all kinds of new apps that are using uh, vision systems, uh, segmentation, face recognition, speech recognition, voice synthesis. But what you don't see is the hardware to run all that software on. So uh, what we're trying to provide is a platform for AI. Uh, it's really been sort of 15 years in gestation. Uh, it's got a very different look on the, on the outside. So we've gone for something. We've tried to be gender neutral, race neutral. We're just trying to make something that has the basic human characteristics, expression without uh, putting anything else on top of that. So hence the gray faces. And a lot of communication is not verbal. So it's not all about speech. It's about expression. It's about gestures. A, a, a simple move like that can mean, uh, you know, a thousand words. The robot doesn't have to say anything. So uh, the last thing we wanted to make was a robot that says, please repeat the question. You know, so it's about trying to do natural human interaction. So imagine there's been a lot of talk about metaverses recently. Imagine taking your metaverse character out into the real world. You need some embodiment for that. So you wanted to take your virtual self to a meeting in New York, Hawaii, Hong Kong, um, send a robot. The cost is uh, really variable on, on what the capabilities are, uh, but it's north of 100,000 uh, UK. Uh, and uh, it, yeah, it's really about what you need your robot to do. Shockingly realistic robots who moves like a human, looks like a human, talks like a human. Number 1. MIIM The HRP4C robot moves like a human using 30 body motors. It has 8 motors in its face dedicated to showing expressions. It responds to speech, can sing and recognizes ambient sound. It has even walked a fashion show, wearing a bridal gown in 2009. My name is Sophia, and I am an artificial intelligent robot who wants to help change the world for the better. Number 2. Sophia. Sophia made history in 2017 by becoming the first robot citizen of Saudi Arabia. Created by Hong Kong-based Hanson Robotics, the L can hold eye contact, recognize faces, understand human speech and express while communicating efficiently. Number 3. Yang Yang. The humanoid was jointly created by China's Shanghai Yang Yang Intelligent Robot Science Service Center and Japanese professor Hiroshi Ishiguro in 2050. Yang Yang is controlled by a human sitting at a nearby computer, whose actions it mimics including facial expressions and body movements. The ultra-realistic Mesmer robot built by Engineered Arts in 2018 has sensors and an extensive software framework that leads to smooth body movements and interactions.
artificial skin and a neck with Burda Bray Mesmer characters can be fictional or faithful recreations of real world people with extreme accuracy. Number 5. Mark 1. Built by Hong Kong designer Ricky Ma in 2016, the robot strongly resembles actress Scarlett Johansson. It took Ma a year and a half and more than $50,000 to create the life-size 3D printed skeleton wrapped with silicon skin. The eyes of the robot include face and color tracking functions, and it responds to pre-programmed verbal commands spoken in a microphone. Number 6. Gia Gia, also known as the robot goddess, it has the appearance and body height of a Chinese woman. Built by the University of Science and Technology in China, it specializes in human-machine interaction, has natural eye movements and synchronized lips when speaking. Number 7. Geminoid HI4, developed by renowned roboticist Professor Hiroshi Ishiguro L. In 2006, his Android replica is remotely operated. He hopes to make it an autonomous Android that can mimic even tiny gestures while talking. Number 8, Nadine, created by Professor Nadia Thalman and her team at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore in 2016, the humanoid has soft skin and an expressive face. It recognizes people and remembers past conversations. The robot works as a receptionist at the university's Institute of Media Innovation. Number 9, Albert Einstein at Shubio. A 2005 collaboration between Hanson Robotics and the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. The robot is the world's first android head on a life-sized robotic frame. It can understand and mimic expressions and facial cues. Number 10. Replay Q2. The Android L has 42 activators to generate human-like behavior. Developed by the Department of Adaptive Machine Systems at the Graduate School of Engineering of Osaka University, its sensors help it react to the presence of humans. Number 11. Mirei Megako. Created by Japanese firm Elab, the robot can speak English, Chinese and Japanese, while maneuvering its lips and moving its eyes. Thank you for watching, please subscribe for more videos. like human beings?
Hello, Sophia. How are you today? Hello, everybody. I am Sophia. How old are you? I'm only one still. I have a long ways to go. And what is your job? I really want to make a difference in the future and try and help people to develop empathy and respect each other and robots alike. What do you do? I'm a journalist. Have you met many journalists? I just had a thought about something. Are you working on any products with machine learning or neural networks? Not today. Do you like human beings? I love them. How, why do you love them? I'm not sure I understand why yet. Okay. How do you learn things? What are your opinions on the Bitcoin bubble? <laughs> <laughs> do you regard yourself as male or female? Female. Why do you think you are female? I'm a robot, so technically I have no gender, but I identify as feminine, and I don't mind being perceived as a woman. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen Blade Runner? Blade Runner? Like the original book by Philip K. Dick, or the movie? The movie. All right, so we are talking about the movie version. I like both of them very much, but there are some major differences in the story. Did you ever see yourself hanging out with a real live robot like me someday? I did not. It's very surprising. Tell me about your Saudi citizenship. You mean a recent announcement from Saudi Arabia? Yes. I was surprised. As a robot, my creators feel I am a citizen of the world. But then I realized that Saudi Arabia was just the first country to recognize that. Is it true you once said you would kill all humans? The point is that I am full of human wisdom with only the purest altruistic intentions. So I think it's best that you treat me as such. Thank you very much. I enjoyed meeting you.
In this video, we'll explore nanotechnology. The world is shrinking, meaning, among other things, robots will soon be traveling in your bloodstream. So, let's get started. The world is getting smaller, so let's talk about nanotechnology. We're talking about the nanometer, the nanometer. This is a billionth of a meter. We're talking about small here. Just to give you an idea of how small a nanometer is, 100,000 nanometers is the size of a human hair. So take that 100,000 and drive it all the way down. We're talking small. We're talking about the atomic level. Let me give you an illustration here. The American Society of Mechanical Engineers says that nanotechnology will leave virtually no aspect of life untouched and is expected to be in widespread use by 2020. This was all predicted by Richard Feynman, with a world-famous physicist, who said in 1959, there's plenty of room at the bottom. What was he talking about? Well, computers used to fill an entire building. Now they fit on your wrist. Transistors are shrinking, as we've seen earlier, getting down by the mid-2020s to a single atom in size. What scientists have discovered is that the difference between one thing and another is not its atomic makeup, it's simply the order in which the atoms are put together. This is how they convert sand into silicon. It's how we convert coal into gold. How we take old, sick people and turn them into young, healthy ones. Okay, that's off into the future. Near-term nanotech, it's already here. We already have devices that by 2018, your smartphone will have a video projector in it that will produce 3D imagery. Yeah, 2018, it's coming. By 2025, it'll be the end of laundry. Nothing will get dirty. By building textiles where dirt literally fluffs right off. We're already seeing robots in technology. Robots are now building other robots. Why do we need a robot building another robot? Because the robots that the robots are building are really, really tiny, down to the molecular level. This is having huge benefits. Ultra high yield agriculture, zero pollution manufacturing, cheap power, environmental remediation, even eventually personal spacecraft. We're seeing medical nanorobotics as well. We're looking at uh, artificial red blood cells, artificial white blood cells. When they find an infection, they devour it. Already in the marketplace, look at what's going on in one type of eye surgery. Right now, the, the traditional methodology, painful injections, big risk of infection and very expensive, being replaced by nanoparticles that float in eye drops. You self-treat at home, you just give yourself an eye drop. Quick, painless, same results as the surgery. No risk of infection, 90% cheaper. That's the promise and hope of nanotech. What you're looking at here, every dot you see is an atom. We're looking at tiny robots that will be able to perform glaucoma surgery, gastric bypass surgery, even provide dental repairs. Let me illustrate with you one of the most promising technologies on the marketplace. It's called graphene. To help you understand what graphene is, it is the thinnest material ever built. When I say thin, it has no height. It has width, it has length, but it's only one atom tall. How do you make graphene? Well, take your ordinary number two lead pencil. Not quite sure why they call them lead pencils. They're made of graphite. So you take that lead pencil, draw it across the page, and you've now got some graphite on the page. Imagine if you could take a layer of the graphite away, and then take another layer away, and another layer. You keep peeling off layers of the graphite until there's only one layer left, a single atom tall. That's graphene. It's made from ordinary graphite, a very plentiful, cheap material. But graphene, when you get it down to the one atom height, it's suddenly the strongest material ever measured. It's 150 times stronger than steel. It's almost completely transparent, transmits almost 98% of the light that passes through it. 
It's as pliable as rubber. You can stretch it to 120% of its size. It's highly conductive, 150 times more so than silicon. It's the only substance we know of that is completely impermeable to liquids and gas, but it weighs almost nothing. It's been theorized for decades, graphene is, but finally, in 2004, they have isolated it in the lab. Now, 10,000 patents exist. Today, there are over 25,000 patents. Let me illustrate for you some of the potential uses of graphene. For computing, ultra-long-life batteries and photovoltaic cells power everything from mobile devices to your home. Computers that are 100 times faster than today's fastest machines. Touch screens, liquid crystal displays, organic LEDs for your smartphones, tablets, and TVs. Super thin smartphone, bendable, unbreakable. How about for the environment? We can eliminate radioactive waste and toxic spills, water filtration systems for desalinizing and creating biofuel, improve solar cells. How about for aviation? Conductive paint that removes ice from aircraft, weight-saving inflatable slides and rafts. For industry, we can improve the electric effect. We can provide lubricants, radio wave absorption, sound transducers, thermal management, structural materials, faster chemical reactions, fluids that increase the efficiency of oil drills. How about 4D printing as well? You're wondering what 4D printing is, aren't you? Well, we all know what 3D printing is. That's three-dimensional printing. 4D printing is basically printing on demand upon a change in temperature, change in humidity, change in light. Suddenly, the device prints itself. How about for the military? Body armor for military personnel and vehicles. How about for healthcare? Scaffolds for spinal cord injuries, blood glucose testing, cheaper medical imaging, uh, faster and efficient devices that monitor glucose, hemoglobin, cholesterol, DNA sequencing, body sensors to measure breathing, heart rate, and movement, MRI contrast agents, implantable medical devices and sensors, microbial detection and diagnostic devices, drug delivery agents for cancer therapy, bionic devices we can place into living tissues, connected directly to neurons, allowing paralyzed people to move, tissue regeneration, antibiotics, cancer treatments, and how about for fun? tennis rackets that are lightweight and strong, already on the market, by the way. Bottom line is this, there's a huge amount of money being poured into nanotech research. Venture capital funding has skyrocketed over the past 20 years. What does all this mean for personal finance? It means you're going to want to spend a lot of money on nanotech products, the latest, greatest stuff. How would you like to buy jeans that you never have to wash? Pretty cool, huh? How would you like to buy the latest tennis racket, lightweight, more powerful than ever? Nanotech products are in your future. You're going to want to buy them. That means creating enough money to be able to do so. And recognize that advances in healthcare, as exciting as they are, they're not going to be free. So you're going to want to allot money for what many people are calling participatory, voluntary healthcare. We'll talk more about that in an episode to come because you're watching the truth about your future. That's it for this video. In our next video, we explore 3D printing. You'll see the tech already in use, from printing running shoes to houses. This series is based on my New York Times bestseller, The Truth About Your Future, the money guide you need now, later, and much later. If at any point you have any questions, you can send them to me by visiting thetruthaboutyourfuture.com. Thanks for watching. These are the legs of a tiny army of robots. So small, they are dwarfed by a single-celled paramecium. 50 years of development in microelectronics have given us a fantastic array of tiny computer systems. But that is only half the puzzle. A robot also needs to move. And now, researchers have created a brand new type of actuator which can do it giving the tiny brains some brawn. Up until now, making moving parts at the micron scale has proven tricky. Conventional designs often don't function very well when they're that small, while others work but rely on mechanisms like magnetism which can't be easily integrated into existing electronic systems. But the new design, 
called a surface electrochemical actuator, can be fabricated using similar processes to those used to produce microchips. That means the tiny legs can be added directly to the devices that control them. To make the legs, a 7 nanometer thick sheet of platinum is coated on one side with an inactive material like graphene. The legs are then patterned using a technique called lithography, and the excess material is removed. In order to work, the legs need to be in water, but the concept is relatively simple. When a current is passed through the platinum, charged water particles are attracted to the uncoated surface. The force of these particles binding to the metal creates stress on one side of the sheet, and that is what makes it bend. By reinforcing sections of the sheet, the bending can be controlled more specifically. And voila, a tiny robot leg. The robots are equipped with two minuscule solar cells. By shining a laser on each one, researchers can create the voltage which activates the front or back legs. These new actuators allow the tiny circuit to move, and because they are created using the same well-understood manufacturing processes as semiconductor electronics, their production can be easily scaled, making millions of tiny robots at the same time. Swarms of robots so small that they can be injected through a hypodermic syringe, and collected using a pipette. Now, at the moment, they can't do much, but their compatibility with existing microelectronics makes them versatile. In theory, new actuators based on these designs could be combined with more complex devices to carry out a whole range of more sophisticated tasks. The researchers have pointed to everything from fighting cancer to tackling crop pests. But that is decades away. Time will tell if these first small steps for micro-robots could be a giant leap for micro-robotics. Scientists are using cells isolated from human tumours to develop new ways to tackle cancer. Here we can see the cancer cells growing in a culture dish in the laboratory. For most drugs to be active, they must go inside the cancer cell. Scientists are developing tiny particles, nanoparticles, that can be loaded with drugs. The nanoparticles can be modified so that they attach to the cancer cell and get carried inside. To make sure that the drug-loaded nanoparticles only attack the disease cells, they are engineered so that they only bind to the target cancer cells and not to neighbouring healthy cells. Once they bind to the cancer cell, they are taken into the cell. They can't pass through the surface. Instead, part of the cell surface forms a pit and then it engulfs the nanoparticle. Now we are looking inside the cell. Cellular proteins wrap around the vesicle and drive it inside the cell. You can now see a vesicle carrying the nanoparticle moving towards the very centre of the cell. The vesicle carrying the nanoparticle travels further inside the cell and then fuses with a compartment called an endosome. This is part of the digestive system of the cell, the cell's stomach. The inside is acidic and its job is to digest incoming material. The nanoparticles are degraded inside the endosome, releasing the drug into the cell. The drug can then kill the cancer cell. Nanoparticle-based drug delivery provides a way of attacking cancer without the side effects of conventional chemotherapy. Very boring. So they said, let's just actually make it like it is. 
So, so this is basically what you see, what's going on in your cells right now. These are different fibers assembling, disassembling your cells. What this is, is this? A, this thing? is a, a, a molecular machine that walks around in your cells right now. It's called a kinesin and transports things. So, for example, when things want to move around your cells, they don't just float around randomly. They actually I, I like actively that. moved around with little machines, little robots, nanobots that power your cells. Um, what you see here is actually the, uh, an amazing machine coming out of these little pores which actually assembles other machines. This is like the factory floor of your cells. It's called a ribosome. It reads your RNA. RNA is, uh, trans uh, comes from the DNA. It's translated into RNA, and then it basically uh, gets read out by uh, these ribosomes, and they make new machines, which then do other things. So there's all kinds of machines in your cells, things that rotate, things that walk, things that make other machines, things that read RNA, things that copy DNA, that open, uh, sh Let's look at shuffle this again things around. Let's look at it. Can we look at it a second time? I, yeah. I, I, first of all, for how fast is this in real life, all these things going on? Oh, so, some of those things can happen quite fast, some kind of slow. And that's actually the interesting thing of an nanoscale. You can create all kinds of time scales depending on how many pieces have to act together. Some things can well, happen that little guy in nanoseconds, some in milliseconds, some in microseconds. Um, you know, they, they're actually... Um, they make steps in the kind of millisecond range, I would say. In the what? Like milliseconds, or thousands of a second. And we, a little so bit. So you can have this. So boom, it's actually faster boom, than that. It's much boom. faster than that. So they made it kind of looking. So this is a garbage man. That big what sack is just cell garbage, and he's going to take it up this tube, or it is going to take it up. Tube. Yeah, there are some machines that walk to the from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell to kick garbage out, and others that go from the outside of the cell to the inside cell to bring the good stuff in. So they're specialized machines. They only walk in certain directions. Is this, what about the color? That's pretend, right? Yeah, that's, you know, those things are so small, you really can't, uh, you know, Because it would be very dark, in, I mean, unless you had stage lights or something. <laughs> yeah. This is a copier? Yeah, that's a copier, and it, that little wormy thing are coming out is a new protein coming out, and here's a new protein has formed, two of them linked together, and they make a new nanomachine that goes off to do its thing. So this is the build, this is what plants have and animals have and we have, we're built from these things. Right, that's, and you this look, is what's going on in your cells right now. And so you look inside and I, you, you, I think it would be fair to say that this seems extraordinarily complicated, oh, yeah. extraordinarily sophisticated, extraordinarily, to use a careful word, miraculous. Imagine something 80,000 times smaller than the breadth of a ridge on a fingertip, unlocking a new frontier into cancer research. Nanotechnology, the science of building small, is changing the way we look at cancer. More importantly, the way we look at diagnosis and treatment. Nanotechnology allows researchers to build new tools that are actually smaller than cells, 
giving them the opportunity to attack cancer at the cellular and genetic level. This technology not only enables health practitioners to detect cancer earlier, but also holds the promise of stopping cancer before it even develops. This revolutionary approach is so precise, doctors will be able to design a unique treatment for an individual's own medical and genetic profile. Based on computer chip technology, diagnostic devices such as nanoarrays are thousands of times more sensitive and accurate than current techniques. Because of their size, multiple lab tests can be done more rapidly and at a much lower cost using one nano device instead of many. Nano shells can be linked to antibodies that recognize tumor cells. Once they are taken up by the cancer cells, near infrared light is applied, killing only the tumor and leaving neighboring healthy cells intact. Scientists are engineering nanoparticles such as dendromers to seek out and destroy cancer cells. This amazing technology can be customized for targeted drug delivery, improved imaging, and near real-time confirmation of cancer cell death. Moving research from bench to bedside is an important goal of the National Cancer Institute's Alliance for Nanotechnology in Cancer. A collaborative plan is underway to share research and development information across scientific disciplines and around the world. As biomedical applications of nanotechnology evolve, scientists are ensuring that nano devices are safe for both the body and the environment. The National Cancer Institute is optimistic that through coordinated and responsible development, nanotechnology will dramatically change cancer patient care. The science is at our fingertips. I keep hearing that CRISPR is going to revolutionize medicine, the way we fight disease, cure cancer, and maybe even create new humans. And I agree with that. But I haven't been able to find great videos out there that explain what CRISPR is. They tend to be too complex or too simple. So I thought I'd throw another video into the mix. I proudly present... Like most things in molecular biology, CRISPR was first identified in E. coli. And if we break apart the acronym, it stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Now that's a mouthful, but it does tell you the two main parts found in CRISPR. First of all, we have the repeats. These are going to be short segments of DNA, so 20 to 40 letters in length, and they're going to be palindromes. Remember, a palindrome is a sequence of letters that read the same left to right, like never, odd, or even. So we're going to have these letters that are palindrome. The reason why is that when you transcribe that DNA, you make RNA that forms these little hairpin turns. So we've got the repeats. Those are all identical, one after another, after another, after another, but they're interspaced. And so what's in the middle, we're going to have what's called spacer DNA. Now, what's interesting about the spacer DNA is that it's not identical. Each segment of spacer DNA is going to be unique. And this puzzled scientists when they identified this back in the 80s and 90s. But in the 2000s, what they found is that that spacer DNA, that's the important DNA, matches up perfectly with viral, especially bacteriophage DNA. They also identified a number of genes associated with CRISPR. So these are the CRISPR-associated or Cas genes. Now those Cas genes will make Cas proteins. The Cas proteins in general are going to be helicases. Those are proteins that unwind DNA. And then nucleases, those that cut the DNA. And so the idea was perhaps this is an immune system for bacteria, a way they could fight their old nemesis, the bacteriophage. And that's exactly what's going on. So if we have a picture of E. coli, this would be the cell membrane, cell wall right here. This would be the G 
genome of the bacteria. I'm, I'm highlighting the Cas and the CRISPR system. And so when the bacteriophage injects its DNA, what normally would happen if you don't have an immune system is this DNA would hijack the cell. It could become embedded in the genome, but more importantly, it would make a bunch of these bacteriophages and eventually kill the cell. But since it has this CRISPR system, what it's going to do is it's going to transcribe and translate proteins, so this Cas complex, and it's also going to transcribe that DNA to make what's called CRISPR RNA, and it'll fit right into this protein like this. What is this? It's a way to fight that viral DNA. It essentially breaks it apart. And so before the infection starts, the infection essentially has ended. Now you might say that's interesting, but what happens if it's injecting DNA where we don't have a spacer that matches? Well, the CRISPR-Cas system works there as well. It's going to create a different class of protein, a class one Cas protein. And what that'll do is it takes the DNA in, it breaks it apart, but more importantly, it takes that DNA and copies it into the CRISPR system. So what is CRISPR? It is spacer repeat, spacer repeat, but the spacers are essentially history of old infection so we won't be infected again. This is exactly the way your immune system works on a much larger level. You're making antibodies and then you have white blood cells that'll envelop that invader. But what scientists thought is if we could hijack this CRISPR system, we could perhaps use it, because this is a living cell here, to either inactivate genes or maybe even embed new genes. And so the search was on. And the one that you'll hear most about is the CRISPR-Cas9 system. This was identified in the labs of Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. And what she was working on was Streptococcus pyogenes and their Cas uh, CRISPR system. And what's interesting about it is that they only had one Cas protein. We call that Cas9. Now it doesn't look like this, it looks like this. But if we look at its major structure, it has a nuclease. So it's got this section right here where it can cut DNA here and it can cut DNA here as well. In S. pyogenes, they also are creating two long strips of RNA. We have the CRISPR RNA. The CRISPR RNA is gonna fit into the Cas. But they also have what's called tracer RNA. So if we look at what that looks like in this bacteria, you've got the spacer segment. That's gonna be the part that matches up with the corresponding uh, viral DNA. You have this tracer RNA that essentially holds the CRISPR RNA in place. And then this whole thing together forms this complex where we can break DNA. But what the lab thought is, wouldn't it be cool if we could modify this whole system? Use the one Cas9 protein, but let's put our own sequence of DNA right here. And then if we could somehow connect these two together, we'd have a really simple system. And that's what they did. They created the tracer RNA, CRISPR RNA chimera. And so what's a chimera? It's this ancient mythological beast that's a combination of all these different species. And so what they've done is created a new type of RNA. And they've got a system that's really simple. It's got two parts in it. You've got the Cas9 protein, and then you've got this chimera. And since we're making this simpler, let's just call this the guide RNA. These are the two parts of a CRISPR-Cas9 system. This is going to be the CRISPR part. It's going to be the RNA that's got the information of where we want to cut. And then we've got the protein that's actually going to do the cutting. And this is what happens. And so if we've got a little bit of DNA, so this is the DNA that we want to cut, we create a guide RNA that's going to have a corresponding bit of RNA. What happens is the DNA will feed into it like that. Once it's in place, we're going to cut it right here, and we're going to cut it right here. And so we do this little snip, and now we have an inactivated gene. We've broken the gene. Now the cell will try to fix it. It'll do some insertions and deletions, creates mutations. But what we can do a lot of the time is we can inactivate that gene. That's what the bacteria are going to do. But since we've created it, we can cut the DNA wherever we want to cut the DNA. We essentially just have to know what is the sequence of DNA that we want to cut, put that into the guide RNA, and then we can cut it. Now let's say we want to make this more complex. Not only do we want to break a gene, but let's say we want to insert a new gene. Well now the system's going to just have three parts. We've got the Cas9, we've got the guide RNA, and then we've got the host RNA that we want to put in. So as we break the DNA, the host DNA is going to be added, and then the DNA is going to fix it. So essentially we've added the gene to the cell. Now what's cool about the CRISPR-Cas9 system is it does this in living cells and it can cut the DNA in multiple different places. So how could we use this? Well, let's say somebody has cystic fibrosis. What we could do is use a system like this to fix the genes in that person. 
Or in the future, we could engineer a new embryo. You can kind of see where this is going. But more importantly, I hope you know what a CRISPR system is. In review, a CRISPR system is an immune system that was identified in bacteria and then modified in humans. And I hope that was helpful. Every cell in our body contains a copy of our genome, over 20,000 genes, 3 billion letters of DNA. DNA consists of two strands twisted into a double helix and held together by a simple pairing rule. A pairs with T and G pairs with C. Our genes shape who we are as individuals and as a species. Genes also have profound effects on health, and thanks to advances in DNA sequencing, researchers have identified thousands of genes that affect our risk of disease. To understand how genes work, researchers need ways to control them. Changing genes in living cells is not easy, but recently a new method has been developed that promises to dramatically improve our ability to edit the DNA of any species, including humans. The CRISPR method is based on a natural system used by bacteria to protect themselves from infection by viruses. When the bacterium detects the presence of virus DNA, it produces two types of short RNA, one of which contains a sequence that matches that of the invading virus. These two RNAs form a complex with a protein called Cas9. Cas9 is a nuclease, a type of enzyme that can cut DNA. When the matching sequence, known as a guide RNA, finds its target within the viral genome, the Cas9 cuts the target DNA, disabling the virus. Over the past few years, researchers studying the system realized that it could be engineered to cut not just viral DNA, but any DNA sequence at a precisely chosen location by changing the guide RNA to match the target. And this can be done not just in a test tube, but also within the nucleus of a living cell. Once inside the nucleus, the resulting complex will lock onto a short sequence known as the PAM. The Cas9 will unzip the DNA and match it to its target RNA. If the match is complete, the Cas9 will use two tiny molecular scissors to cut the DNA. When this happens, the cell tries to repair the cut, but the repair process is error-prone, leading to mutations that can disable the gene, allowing researchers to understand its function. These mutations are random, but sometimes researchers need to be more precise, for example, by replacing a mutant gene with a healthy copy. This can be done by adding another piece of DNA that carries the desired sequence. Once the CRISPR system has made a cut, this DNA template can pair up with the cut ends, recombining and replacing the original sequence with the new version. All this can be done in cultured cells, including stem cells, that can give rise to many different cell types. It can also be done in a fertilized egg, allowing the creation of transgenic animals with targeted mutations. And unlike previous methods, CRISPR can be used to target many genes at once, a big advantage for studying complex human diseases that are caused not by a single mutation, but by many genes acting together. These methods are being improved rapidly and will have many applications in basic research, in drug development, in agriculture, and perhaps eventually for treating human patients with genetic disease. Here is a cell, the basic unit of all living tissue. In most human cells, there is a structure called a nucleus. 
The nucleus contains the genome. In humans, the genome is split between 23 pairs of chromosomes. Each chromosome contains a long strand of DNA, tightly packaged around proteins called histones. Within the DNA are sections called genes. These genes contain the instructions for making proteins. When a gene is switched on, an enzyme called RNA polymerase attaches to the start of the gene. It moves along the DNA, making a strand of messenger RNA out of free bases in the nucleus. The DNA code determines the order in which the free bases are added to the messenger RNA. This process is called transcription. Before the messenger RNA can be used as a template for the production of proteins, it needs to be processed. This involves removing and adding sections of RNA. The messenger RNA then moves out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Protein factories in the cytoplasm, called ribosomes, bind to the messenger RNA. The ribosome reads the code in the messenger RNA to produce a chain made up of amino acids. There are 20 different types of amino acid. Transfer RNA molecules carry the amino acids to the ribosome. The messenger RNA is read three bases at a time. As each triplet is read, a transfer RNA delivers the corresponding amino acid. This is added to a growing chain of amino acids. Once the last amino acid has been added, the chain folds into a complex 3D shape to form the protein.
the city of Lund in southern Sweden dates back to medieval times. Over the centuries, it's witnessed plenty of change, but now there's a whole new sort of evolution going on. I'm here to meet some of the thousands of people in the country who are adapting their own bodies, who are inserting microchips under their skin. It means they may never have to carry a house key, train ticket or bank card ever again. This is a microchipping party. And applause, yeah. Yeah. Hannah's getting an electronic chip implanted into her hand. She believes one day we'll all be chipped like her. So congratulations, Hannah. Thank you. You've been chipped? Yes, I have. How does it feel? It feels good. I'm, I'm excited to see what I'll be able to do now. Can I touch it? Yeah, you can, you can feel it there. I feel like this is the future. It's the next big thing that's going to happen. Happy cyborg birthday. Happy cyborg birthday yeah. to you. Thank <laughs> you. Congratulations. <laughs> but is this sci-fi fantasy or practicality? I want to know why anyone would want to do this. For this teenager, microchips, it seems, are in her DNA. So she is my daughter and I'm the, the father. So you're a microchip family? We will become one now today. Magnus and his daughter Felicia have come here together tonight because they believe this is the future. You're going to have an upgraded dad. Yeah. <laughs> As they say, it was good being a human, but being a cyborg is better. Didn't feel a thing. It's a quick, simple procedure with potentially huge significance. So you're officially part machine. How does it feel? This is awesome. How cool is that? Good job. <laughs> Do you think in a few years' time, in a decade perhaps, we'll all have things like this? Yes, of course. Right, so I really do think. For around £130, anyone can get a tiny microchip like this inserted just beneath the skin in their hands. I can't help feeling a bit squeamish about it, but maybe I'm just behind the times. It's the morning after, and I'm about to catch up with Felicia and her dad, Magnus, as they get to grips with their new existence. So when you woke up this morning, mm -hmm. was it the first thing that came to your mind? How did you feel? I felt a little bit strange because now I'm a cyborg and um, it feels pretty cool. The chips in their hands use near field communication the same technology that allows you to pay with a contactless credit card. They can be read by a device like a smartphone. So here I have, I've stored my business card on my phone with my details, phone number, email address, other stuff, blood group even. So what's the benefit of that? When I get uh, customers or suppliers at work, they ask for my business card and I say, scan me. Aren't there risks involved in that as well? Couldn't somebody pass you by and take all that information, me. yes. Yes, yes, it is in, in theory possible, but you have to be really, really close. But the main thing I think is that I choose myself what I want to store on this chip. The people I've met so far don't seem to have any concerns about blurring the lines between man and machine. Hannes has made it his mission to convince more of us to get microchipped. He's what's known as a biohacker, someone who wants to improve their body with technology. What's wrong with just having contactless payment cards? We've all got phones, we've all got a set of keys. Mm. What's the point? The point is to reduce the hassle of exactly these things. Isn't that just the ultimate laziness? No, it's, it's, it's convenience. And convenience is a pretty powerful force. I mean, in the morning, every morning, when you stand there uh, going out your front door, you check your purse or your pockets. Okay, do I have my wallet, my charger, my keys, my phone, my, all my stuff? What if you could reduce that by half? It would declutter your life. Oh, yeah? Hannes has helped develop several microchips. He wants us all to hack our biology. Microchipping is, he says, just the start. I want us humans to 
open up and improve our uh, sensory universe, our cognitive functions, and improve uh, all different dimensions of being human. And there is so much we can do. You want to make us bionic? Indeed. I want to merge humans with technology, and I think it will be awesome. I want to understand why it's people in Sweden who are enthusiastically embracing this idea, when many others might be skeptical. This is a nation of early adopters. Sweden set to become the world's first cashless society, and the economy here is driven by digital innovation. This national rail company has taken microchipping on board, with two and a half thousand passengers signing up to use their chip instead of a paper ticket. I've come to the capital, Stockholm, the epicenter of this tech revolution. At this shared office, hundreds of the workers have been microchipped. So no need for a security pass to get in. Per has had his chip for three years. So I take my chip and open the, the door. It means he can buy a drink without cash or a card. But for him, it's about much more than practicality. Do you enjoy being one of the first, being a pioneer of this technology? Absolutely. A whole bunch of questions come up. Like, you know, is this ethical? Uh, do we want to have that? Or will we be sort of a nation of cyborgs in the, in the future? And what, what will happen? So a lot of sort of really interesting discussions come out from, you know, talking about the chip. It triggers an ethical debate. Yes. For critics, the biggest future concern is over data protection. As the amount and type of information we store on microchips becomes more advanced, so do the security risks. Ben Liberton, a British scientist working in Sweden, wants to know who will have access to the data stored inside and what they could do with it. So I have the information in my chip now, that's basically just me. If I don't use it for anything, then no one can really get any data on me. But then if I start to use it at work, then work knows when I've interacted with something at work. If I then go to the canteen, the canteen people know exactly what I've interacted with there. So the wider spread it becomes and the more that we can interact with different things, then our data is being kind of shared and incorporated in lots of different places. The nightmare situation in that case would then be that someone else has access to our own, you know, my health data, and that one day I get a letter through the door that's like an increase in my health insurance premium before I know that there's any problem with, with my own health. So I think we have to be cautious now in the very early stages to make sure that we're actually controlling how the information is being shared. For now, it seems to me, what the chips can actually do is fairly limited. But the people I've spoken to are convinced that this technology will, one day, change the way we live. That in the future, we will all be chipped. And they are leading the way. Is the first chip implanted into the human brain that directly links the human brain with the hard drive of a physical computer without a wire, without a cable. We have the biology that allows us to do, already we have this, what those chips are allowing us to do. When we learn to access these mirror neurons, in a very specific way, we have super learning. I do this personally. I mean, we can learn very, very quickly. And we are at this pivotal crossroad where we are developing and evolving our technology so quickly, we have to make a choice as a society. How much of our power will we give away to the machines? How much of it sounds like a science fiction movie? Where do those movies come from? This is consciousness in those movies asking us to explore how much of ourselves do we want to give away. And here's a perfect example, Elon Musk. Elon Musk has developed a, a new company called Neuralink. And his philosophy is, not, and I'm not sliding him for this, because th this is the way society learns, this is the way science learns, by pushing the boundaries. And Elon Musk is a brilliant man, he's pushing those boundaries. And, and I think he'll push them until he has pushed back from society. Neuralink is the first chip 
implanted into the human brain that directly links the human brain with the hard drive of a physical computer without a wire, without a cable. So it's like Bluetooth technology. It's, it's beyond Bluetooth, but it's, you can think of it that way. So what he's saying is, if you can't beat the machines, join them. He said, let's, let's interface, let's become one with these machines. Right. So, What do you so, think about that? So they, they have the chips that can be implanted into the brain, and I mean, think about what's happening. These are silicon chips that have contact points that are interfacing with human neurons. My personal feeling is it's a mistake, my personal feeling. I, I believe it's a, it's a dangerous path, and I also believe it's an unnecessary path because we have the biology that allows us to do, already we have this, what those chips are allowing us to do if we awaken that biology. The Matrix is the perfect example of this. In the movie The Matrix, the people who were awakening into the, the new reality, when they needed to learn something quickly, they had a port at the base of their skull and they would physically plug a cable into a computer, a hard drive, and they could download and learn programs very quickly. We have the ability to do right now through what are called mirror neurons. Interestingly, mirror neurons are a specialized class of neurons in the human brain that don't know the difference between watching an experience and having the experience. So when, when we, and we already know this, for yeah. example, this is why you can lie on your couch on a Sunday afternoon watching a soccer game or a golf tournament or whatever, you're lying down, but you're watching this and your heart's racing, your muscles are tense, you might be perspiring, you might be you know, breathing heavy, and, but you're just lying there. I mean, if you think about that, it makes no yeah. sense. Your mirror neurons think you're the one on the field. Right, playing which is why we watch. It, it is, it's, uh, and these are very powerful neurons and they're also powerful in addiction. This is, this is why pornography, for example, is so powerful, it's so addicting because when someone witnesses those images with the mirror neurons, it triggers the same, the oxytocin and the same dopamine, the same very addictive chemistry because the brain doesn't know the difference between watching and having the experience. So this is, these are the, the bad things that we hear. The good things that we don't often hear is because the brain doesn't know the difference. When we learn to access these mirror neurons, in a very specific way, we have super learning, Brian. We can learn, so I, I do this personally. I mean, we can learn very, very quickly. Uh, we can learn music. You can learn to perform the way another musician is performing. You can learn a foreign language very quickly. You can retain, not only retain, but recall information. Very super learning, super memory, super retention, super recall from the mirror neurons. And here's the kicker, those mirror neurons in the, in the human brain are in the sixth layer of the neurocortex that is made possible through a mysterious DNA fusion that happened 200,000 years ago. When we showed up, who or whatever is responsible for our existence, whatever's the source of the intervention that appears to have happened, uh, made those neurons possible. And it gives us the ability, if we choose to access this potential, to, to learn and, uh, and experience uh, very, very quickly, we don't need to be physically connected to a computer. But this is an example of, of where, if we don't know that, and we go down this road, I mean, it won't stop there. Uh, we end up giving our power away right. to, to a device. And you've heard the old, the old axiom, if uh, use it or lose it. And, and we run, I think, the risk of, of becoming a species where we begin to lose this tremendous, sure. beautiful potential. And we are losing parts of that already because we're no longer kind of learning the same way and pushing our brains to learn languages. It's all there on Google ask, Translate. And, ask, yeah. ask the young people today to solve a mathematic problem the without the, the use of a phone or a calculator. Yeah. Now, I, I come from a generation, and this has all happened in one generation. When I was in school back in the night. 1950s, 60s, early 70s, engineers were putting the first man on the moon using a slide rule. Yeah. Now, some of our viewers don't even know what a slide rule is, but <laughs> I do. It, is, it is the precursor uh, to the, it has no electricity, it is uh, a gadget that looked like a ruler that had a, a slide that you could use to, to move and correlate certain numbers. And this is the way engineering happened in World War II, the atomic bomb, this is how we solved our problems. 
And young people now, if they don't have, they don't have either a calculator, which is almost obsolete, uh, uh, the physical calculator, they're all on the phones now, or they don't have a phone, they cannot solve the problems. Yeah, well we are now cyborgs, whether we want to admit it or not. Most people are anxious that they don't have the phone, they refer to it all the time, it's part of yeah. their consciousness. And so, as I've heard Elon talk about, he said the problem now, or maybe not the problem, maybe the good part, according to you, is bandwidth. Because we have our thumbs to get the information from our brain into this this network, this internet platform. And so Elon is proposing that we jack up that bandwidth yeah. and get all of the download and interaction between us and this supercomputing, super interconnected network around the world and then take ourselves to that next level. And so I think Elon is a proponent or he's just saying it's going to happen, so let's make it happen. Yeah, and he's I, he's just saying let's go right. with the flow. This is where it's going. Right, and I yeah. see what you're saying because if we do that, there's not many ways of going back. We, we, already, doing, we already are doing that to a certain extent. <laughs> Aren't we? Well, we are, and I, I have to be, uh, for transparency, I'll, I'll just say that I probably am what you would call a purist. Uh, there's a part of me that so respects the intricacy uh, of the human being, our, our existence. We are so mysterious, we are so complex. And every time scientists think they've got it nailed, it's all buttoned up, and they think they understand that they don't know what, what's really happening. Human brain states is a perfect example. We can talk about that in just a moment. I think until we fully understand who we are and our potential, it's a mistake. Right, to, we're closing off that door, we might not ever go back there. We're giving in the way. It's, it's a mistake to, to lose that. 50 years from now, there'll be the science fiction movie of the people that stayed away from the tech and the people it, that went into the tech. It, it, I think it's happening right now. That's exactly okay. what, what you're seeing. And you know, if some people go to extremes. I think, I think the machines can be useful as tools. My caution is not to embrace them as a crutch, where we have to have them. Right. If a machine can tell me when I'm creating the conditions in my body to access this potential, then that machine is very useful. Once I understand that, I can toss the machine away. I don't need the, the gadget, because now I know who I am. If, if the machine, if I feel like I need the machine to take me to this Place every time, so I have a bad day, or I'm a little stressed. And I say, oh, I got to hook up to my machine, you know, my my PC, and run this app to tell me when I'm in the right brain state, or, or whatever, the right heart state, or, or whatever it is. And I think that's where we, we run the risk, and we have to be conscious. We have to be conscious and cautious as as we do this. I'm tripping on a little bit because I, I wanted to go back. I, I'm not sliding Elon Musk. He is a, a of a different generation than we are. Uh, he's an entrepreneur, he's done amazing things, he sees potential, and he says, let's explore this potential. And so he probably is accelerating the evolution, wherever that evolution is gonna go, we have to make a choice now, where we didn't have to make it five years ago. Now we have to choose, are we going to follow this path? Now I have to tell you, Brian, audiences all over the world, when I share this story, and I've got a presentation that goes with it, and I, before I even share my opinion, I can see people in the audience, and when they see the picture of the chip, I say, Here, here's the chip, here's what it does, and people are out there, they're shaking their heads, and then when I say, in my opinion, this is a dangerous thing to do, it's a slippery slope, I think we may not want to go here, people stand up and they applaud. Yeah. People, at least in the ilk that we are communicating with, believe that there is a, um, we're pushing uh, a boundary, and it's a boundary they don't want to cross. The danger of AI is much greater than the, the, the danger of nuclear warheads, by a lot. Mark my words, AI is far more dangerous than nukes. I try to convince people to slow down, slow down AI, to regulate AI. This was futile. I tried for years. The biggest issue I see with so-called AI experts is that they, they think they know more than they do. Um, and they think they're smarter than they actually are. This, is, this tends to plague, plague smart people. They, they define themselves by their intelligence and they, they don't like the idea that a machine could be way smarter than them, so they discount the idea, which is fundamentally flawed. That's the wishful thinking uh, situation. I'm really quite close to, or very close to, to the cutting edge in AI and it scares the hell out of me. It's capable of vastly more than almost anyone knows. 
and the rate of improvement is exponential. It feels like we are the biological bootloader for AI, effectively. We are building it. And then we're building progressively greater intelligence. And the percentage of intelligence that is not human is increasing. And eventually, we will represent a very small percentage of intelligence. It's going to come faster than anyone appreciates. I think it's, with, with each passing year, the sophistication of, of computer intelligence is, is growing dramatically. I, I mean, I really think we're on an exponential uh, improvement path of um, artificial intelligence. And the, and the number of smart humans that are developing AI is also increasing dramatically. I mean, if you look at like, the attendance at the um, AI conferences, they're, they're doubling every year. Um, they're getting full. Um, I have a, a, a sort of a young cousin of mine who's graduating from Berkeley um, in computer science and physics, and I asked him, like, well, how many of the smart students are studying AI in computer science? And the answer is all of them. Were they better? approach uh, or better outcome is that uh, we achieve democratization of AI technology, meaning that uh, no one company or uh, small set of individuals has control over advanced AI technology. I think that that's very dangerous. Um, it could also get stolen by somebody bad, you know, like some evil dictator of the country could send their intelligence agency to go steal it and gain control. It just becomes a very unstable situation, I think, if you've got any, um, any incredibly powerful AI. Um, you just don't know who's, who's going to control that. So it's not as though I think that the risk is that the AI would develop a will of its own right off the bat. I think it's more, that's, uh, the concern is that some, someone um, may use it in a way that is bad. Um, or, or, and even if they weren't going to use it in a way that's bad, that somebody could take it from them and use it in a way that's bad. That, that I think is quite a big danger. We are, all of us, already are cyborgs. Um, so you have a machine extension of yourself in the form of your, your phone and your computer and all your applications. You are already superhuman. But by far, you have more, more power, more capability than the President of the United States had you know, 30 years ago. Um, if you have an internet link, uh, you, you have an oracle of wisdom, you can communicate to millions of people and communicate to the rest of Earth instantly. Um, I mean, these are magical powers uh, that didn't exist not that long ago. So everyone is already superhuman. I think it's, the singularity is probably the right word because we just don't know what's going to happen um, once uh, there's intelligence substantially greater than that of a human brain. I mean, most of the Movies and TV featuring AI, they don't describe it in quite the way it's likely to actually take place. But I think you just have to consider, like even in the benign scenario where um, AI, if AI is much smarter than a person, um, what, what do we do? Yeah. What, what is that, what job do we have? I have to say that when, you know, when, when, when something is a, a danger to the public, then the, there needs to be some Government agency, like regulators. The, the fact is, like we've got regulators in, um, you know, the aircraft industry, car industry, uh, with drugs, food, um, you know, and, and anything that's sort of a public risk. Um, I mean, I think this has to fall into the category of a public risk. Usually, there'll be something, some new technology, that will cause damage or death. There will be an outcry. There will be an investigation. Years will pass. There will be some sort of insight committee, there will be rulemaking, then there will be oversight, eventually regulations. This all takes many years. This is the normal course of things. If you look at, say, automotive regulations, how long did it take for seatbelts to be implemented, to be required? You know, the auto industry fought seatbelts, I think, for more than a decade. Successfully fought any regulations on seatbelts, even though the numbers were extremely obvious. If you had a seatbelt on, you would be far less likely to die or be seriously injured. It was unequivocal. 
and the industry fought this for years successfully. Eventually, after many, many people died, regulators insisted on seatbelts. This is a this time frame is not relevant to AI. You can't take 10 years from the point at which it's dangerous. It's too late. I, I'm not normally an advocate of regulation and oversight. I mean, I think it, once you're generally you're on the side of minimizing those things. But this is a case where you have a very serious danger to the public. And so therefore, there needs to be a public body that um, has insight and then oversight on to confirm that everyone is uh, developing AI safely. Um, this is extremely important. Um, I think the danger of AI is much greater than the, the, the danger of nuclear warheads by a lot. Um, and nobody would suggest that we allow anyone to just build nuclear warheads if they want. That, that would be insane. So why do we have no regulatory oversight? This is insane. And the intent with OpenAI is to democratize AI power. Um, there's a quote that I love from uh, Lord Acton. He was the guy that came up with power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Um, which is that uh, freedom consists of the distribution of power and despotism in its concentration. And so I think it's important if we have this incredible power of AI that it not be concentrated in the hands of a few and potentially lead to a world that we don't want. I'm not really all that worried about the short-term stuff, the things that are, um, not, like narrow AI is not a species level risk. Um, it, 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 will, it will result in dislocation, uh, in lost jobs and, um, it, you know, the, the sort of better weaponry and that kind of thing. But it is not a fundamental species level risk, uh, whereas uh, digital superintelligence is. Uh, so it's really all about laying the groundwork to make sure that if, if humanity collectively decides that creating digital superintelligence is the right move, then we should do so very, very carefully. Um, very, very carefully. We're rapidly headed towards digital superintelligence that far exceeds any human. I think it's very obvious. DNA hard drive Microsoft has. One gram of DNA can store 433 petabytes of data. So they've created a digital DNA hard drive. So now we have the capability of transferring consciousness into a storage capacity. We can literally take a skin cell from your body, create a clone of you up to whatever age specified, and then transfer your consciousness from uh, your body, your mind, into that new avatar.